It's a pleasure for me to be here and say hello to so many of my friends from Oak Ridge. I will be addressing my remarks mostly to the visitors, people who are not from Oak Ridge. Uh, for one thing, Oak Ridgers have heard me talk many, many times, and as my younger son often tells me, Pop, you're a man of few words, but you sure repeat yourself. <laughs> But also, I think uh, in a discussion of the environment and the role of nuclear energy uh, in respect to the problems of the environment, uh, you come to Oak Ridge and you want to find out, well, what do these old nukes really think about it? And there are a variety of questions that I think us old nukes uh, ought to give you some feeling for our views on. Uh, why is it, for example, that on the whole nuclear energy is disliked by the American people, in fact by most people in the world today, despite the fact that about 19% uh, of all of our electricity now is produced by nuclear energy. So what I shall try to do in these few minutes here is to try to place this issue of why do people dislike nuclear energy in a much broader context, uh, in the context of why are people generally skeptical of advanced technologies, why are people particularly skeptical of technologies which they view as being intrusive on the environment. And then I'd like to share with you a few of my own ideas and ideas of others in the nuclear establishment uh, about how to uh, make nuclear energy once more an acceptable energy choice. Uh, because you must realize that although fully 19% about, it's actually 20% now, of our electricity now comes from nuclear energy. We have not built a new nuclear reactor, started a new, new nuclear reactor, for uh, going on 16 years. Uh, I like to say that the first nuclear era, which has culminated in the building of 110 very large nuclear reactors producing this 20% of our electricity. The first nuclear era has ended. The uh, basic question is, will there be a rebirth of nuclear energy, a second nuclear uh, era? And indeed, what really has to happen in order for nuclear energy to once more become acceptable and thus uh, to embark again on what I call the second nuclear era. Problem here? We're we getting, more convenient. Are we getting too much feedback? No. I just want to make it the oh, way that you yeah. will be able to talk into them. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, it always pays to have a, a real pro in the audience. Uh, well, let me begin with uh, some observations on why I think the first nuclear era has ended. In brief, uh, the first nuclear era has ended uh, because we have entered into what I like to call an age of anxiety. Some of you may recall that Leonard Bernstein's second symphony is entitled The Age of Anxiety. What I mean by this is that although uh, our quality of life, as measured, if you like, by, I suppose, the most important single criterion for the quality of life, which is life expectancy. Our life expectancy has increased in the West, and particularly in the United States, by about 20 years since the turn of the century. 
And yet, despite the fact that we're all living longer, we seem to fear death more than ever before. Everywhere, we find things that are doing us in. One week, it's alar on apples. Another week, it's whatever it is that they put on cranberries. Uh, a third week, it's uh, mercury in the environment. And so on and on and on and on. And so one is given to ask, what's going on here? Uh, we live longer than ever before, and yet we fear dying more than ever before. Indeed, we have given up the notion that there's such a thing as a natural death. Every death must now be attributed to some very specific uh, cause, an identifiable or presumed uh, cause. And in this, I would remind you, we seem to be going back to a kind of primitivism. There's a very famous uh, French anthropologist, his name is Levy Bruhl, and he pointed out that one of the primary characteristics of primitive societies is that in a primitive society, the notion of natural death was never accepted. If you died, it was because uh, your enemy had poisoned you, or if he hadn't poisoned you, he had uh, uttered some terrible imprecation and the gods somehow were not friendly to you, they were friends of your enemy, and so, and so you died. Uh, I think we ought to think about that very hard uh, the next time we are confronted with the scare of the weak. <laughs> that uh, we're all living longer. Well, look at me, I'm 75 years old. Never expected to live to be 75 years old. Uh, and yet, we worry about dying all the time. Uh, now, it is, of course, true that uh, although many of the deleterious, presumed deleterious effects that are causing us, well, I would say causing us to live longer, but in public perception causing us uh, to somehow die earlier, uh, are attributable to technology. And indeed, it is, of course, true that there have been technological catastrophes don't like to quite call them environmental catastrophes, but all right, let's call them environmental catastrophes. I can tick them off. There was Three Mile Island, which of course was a, a, a terrible incident as far as the general public utility company was concerned, but nobody was hurt in Three Mile Island, fortunately. But then there were, of course, the much more serious accidents. There was the Challenger. Uh, there was Bhopal, which was the worst industrial accident ever. Uh, 2,000 people died at Bhopal, and Lord knows how many were hurt by this cloud of methyl isocyanate that uh, emerged from that plant in India. And then, of course, there was Chernobyl. Chernobyl, 31 people actually died more or less immediately. Some question as to how many uh, who contracted serious radiation disease but then survived, how many of those are going to uh, die fairly soon. Uh, if one looks at the data from the vast statistics about the atom bombing in uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, then one would actually expect that those who were seriously ill but then recovered, that they would by and large live a pretty normal lifespan, although there's some argument about that now. But there's no question that Chernobyl was a, a catastrophe of immense order catastrophe of immense order, largely because so much land was interdicted. Uh, interdicted because the land became slightly radioactive, and this means that people who live on that land uh, probably would not have their lifespan shortened uh, 
Uh, since the best estimates that we can get for much of that interdicted land is that the radiation levels that these people would be exposed to would be about like the radiation levels that people who live in a, who work in a radiation environment are exposed to. And there's really no evidence that people who work in the nuclear plants uh, have their life expectancy significantly. That means statistically shortened. Incidentally, uh, one of the groups that lives in a high radiation environment, of course, are a airline pilots and airline stewardesses. And uh, so far as I know, uh, at least thus far, there's no evidence that airline pilots are having their lives significantly shortened. But my point is that there are indeed real technological disasters, and this is part of the reason why uh, the public tends in many respects to be uh, very suspicious of technologies, especially in relation to the environment. But I want to repeat that by and large, the alleged uh, pollutions that occur in the environment as a result of normal technological activity, on the whole, are at levels which, uh, as far as epidemiological studies show, uh, do not cause measurable uh, <coughs> shortening of lifespan. I remind you, we, live, we all live longer now, and if our environment is all that polluted, why are we living longer? Good question. Well, but I speak as a technologist, and uh, technologists, especially in the Western democracies, perhaps with Glasnost and, and the Soviet Union also, it is not we technologists who are the ones who are going to decide how safe is safe enough, how safe a technology has to be. It is the public that makes that decision. And if the public's estimate of how safe is safe enough is different from the estimate that the technologist makes, then the technologist has no choice, really, but to conform to public opinion. And indeed, let me quote from a recent report by the Environmental Protection Agency in which they're discussing how they establish priorities for the various kinds of cleanups that they're involved in. You would expect, if they were simply a bunch of technologists, uh, that they would decide which pose the biggest danger, and those are the ones that they would give their highest priority to. But we read in the 1988 report, annual report of the Environmental Protection Agency, priorities at the Environmental Protection Agency are more closely aligned with, a public, with public opinion than with estimated risks. An extraordinary admission, I would say. That if the public decides that such and such is unclean and you have to do something about it, then that's where the priority is going to go, despite the fact that the epidemiological studies, the scientific studies that, that, uh, on which these epidemiological studies are based, uh, say that this is not the proper allocation of resources. Well, what then can the response of the technologists be, uh, given that the technologists must respond to the public's desires, even though those publics, the public's desires often don't make sense to the technologists who have studied the issue. Well, there are two possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is that the public's attitude will change. Well, there are three possibilities. Uh, and I should start first with the possibility that the technologist's attitude will somehow change, that he'll look at his statistics, at his epidemiology, and say, oops, we made a terrible boo-boo, and in fact, the public has really been correct all the time in estimating that these very small, uh, very low levels of, of uh, environmental insult really are terrible. 
But then you always have that terrible question, yeah, that may be so, but why are we living longer if, if we're being poisoned? Why are we living longer? So I don't think that that's going to happen, that the technologists, the epidemiologists, will come out with results that conform to the public's general estimate. I think it's uh, possibly more likely that the public's attitude will change. And the public's attitude, I think, will probably change, not because uh, it really believes that these things out in the environment aren't doing damage. I think it's more likely that it will change because there may arise <coughs> other dangers, other risks, which the public eventually perceives to be greater than these low-level risks that are the effluence of normal technology. And they will then be confronted with a choice, which risk is the lesser risk. Uh, the best example of that is the one that I think may have been mentioned here earlier, and that is the whole business of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the so-called greenhouse effect. Don't have to belabor the point that carbon dioxide is uh, increasing in the atmosphere. It's been increasing by about one part per million for the past, oh, 40 years since people first started measuring it. Uh, and, of course, as you all know, uh, the Earth is supposed to become a, a hothouse. Uh, we don't really know whether that's going to happen. I happen to be uh, believe that it's more likely to be the case than not. But my point is that should greenhouse really become uh, a matter of deep public concern, and it is beginning, beginning to become a matter of deep public concern, then I think the public's attitude towards nuclear energy is rather likely to change because uh, the man in the street, so to speak, will have to answer now, which is worse, uh, hothouse, greenhouse earth, or the possibility that you might have an accident in a nuclear reactor. So on the whole, I tend to be somewhat uh, optimistic that the public will begin to put risks in better perspective and that uh, this may serve as the uh, public sanction, if you like, for a rebirth of nuclear energy, the beginning of what I call the second nuclear era. But I think there is a third possibility which I'd like to pursue with you. And that is uh, the possibility of going back to these technologies which the public views as being threatening and improving the technologies uh, to such an extent that the public no longer perceives them to be threatening. Uh, this is what I would call a technological fix. Uh, the idea of going back to the drawing board uh, and fixing up technology so that the public will find threatening technologies to be less thre threatening is uh, not all that old an idea. It really got started uh, in 1974. In 1974 in England, there was a big chemical plant at a place called Flixborough. And uh, they were manufacturing something called cyclohexane. And one day there was a big explosion at the plant. 28 people were killed at the plant, but uh, had the explosion occurred during uh, working hours, probably several thousand people would have been killed, something like Bhopal, possibly. And it was at that time that the, uh, a Professor Kletz was his name, who was the uh, director of safety for Imperial Chemicals Limited, came up with the following idea. It said, look, we've always been conscious of uh, problems of safety in the chemical industry. We try to build our plants that are safe, but we don't design the plants ab initio to be safe. 
what we do is we design them so that they're as cheap as possible, if you like, and then we add various safety measures onto the plant after the plant has been designed. And he said, why don't we start over and introduce new principles of chemical plant safety. He called them inherent safety. That means that the thing is safe not because you have all kinds of safety systems that make it safe. It's safe because it's inherently safe. And he offered some uh, kind of homely, rather obvious advice on how to make a chemical plant safe. And one of the most important things he said in making chemical plants safe is if you're dealing with a terribly, terribly toxic substance, like the stuff that got out at Bhopal, uh, methyl isocyanide. Uh, one of the principles that you should adopt is never store the stuff in a container that's much larger than this. So that if the container bursts or something goes bad, then just a little bit of the material will escape. Well, you look at the design of the Bhopal plant, and the Bhopal plant actually had three tanks. Each tank had a capacity of about 50 tons of uh, methyl isocyanate. And that's really basically why Bhopal was such a terrible disaster. It had been designed before these ideas of inherent safety had been promulgated by Professor Kletz. And so people said, well, it's cheaper to have a few large tanks than a large number of small tanks, and we will have all these safety systems, valves that shut off and, and uh, scrubbers and so on. Well, what happened at Bhopal is that the tanks, well, they didn't quite explode. Yeah, it was kind of an ex explosion. And all of the secondary systems failed. Had the thing been built according to Kletz's principle, then Bhopal would not have been the terrible catastrophe that was probably the worst industrial accident ever. Uh, well, the same idea was invented uh, entirely independently, as a matter of fact, in the nuclear business. Uh, it was prompted, I suppose, by the decision taken in Sweden about a dozen years ago. Sweden, although it has 12 of the best running reactors in the world. And although almost 50% of Sweden's electricity is now produced by nuclear reactors, nevertheless, people, especially after the Three Mile Island incident, uh, voted in a referendum whose language was rather ambiguous. The parliament interpreted it to mean that Sweden should quit nuclear energy. And in fact, the plan in Sweden is to give up all of nuclear energy, shut down all the reactors, don't build any more reactors, by about the year 2010. It's not so long from now. It's only 20 years from now. And whether or not that is a sensible decision, and more and more people in Sweden actually are beginning to think, well, maybe it's not such a good decision, especially since the reactors there operate so well. Uh, nevertheless, it did prompt uh, some of the Swedish reactor designers to say, is it possible to go back to the drawing board and to design a device, a nuclear reactor, which embodies the same principles of inherent safety that uh, Professor Kletz proposed for uh, the design of chemical plants. Now, many of us old timers in the business who thought we'd uh, heard every single idea, both good and bad, in nuclear design over the past 50 years, thought that this was impossible. But to make a long story short, it appears that it is not impossible. And there are a number of ideas, uh, very serious ideas, that have been put forward by Swedish engineers, by American engineers, uh, German engineers, uh, for going back to the drawing board and to use this period of moratorium, which might last another 10, 15, 20 years, to devise new kinds of nuclear reactors which are immune from the kind of accident that occurred certainly at Chernobyl, but even an accident of the 
sort that occurred at Three Mile Island. I should, as an aside, point out that the Chernobyl reactor is entirely different from the kind of reactors that are built in the West. And in fact, uh, when about 10 years ago, the Chernobyl reactor was uh, examined by a group of safety engineers from uh, Great Britain, uh, their advice was uh, shut the damn things down because they're unsafe. And in fact, uh, I should say that in the United States, the original reactors that were built to produce plutonium, which were built in a terrible hurry, I mean, every single day that uh, we delayed in getting those reactors meant that many more people were being killed in, in the war and so we cut whatever corners there were. One of the most important corners was we only had a limited amount of uranium and you had to do the best you could with that amount of uranium. And the only way to make the things operate with that limited amount of uranium was to build them in a way that uh, subjected them to the same kind of, we say, instability as uh, was encountered at Chernobyl. And a few years after the war, I think it was about 1949, the American Reactor Safeguard Committee, in examining those wartime reactors, said, shut them down, they're unsafe, and they were shut down. They were shut down. And the uh, uh, reactors that replaced them did not uh, have the same problem that, that was encountered at Chernobyl. So, I guess my main point then is that the technologists generally, and then I speak not only of reactor technologists, nuclear technologists, but chemical engineering technologists, oil tanker technologists, uh, it seems to me are going back to the drawing board in response to the public's reaction during this age of anxiety and are, I believe, coming up with technological fixes that meet uh, the main concerns as they seem to be expressed by the public or by the articulate spokesmen, skeptical elite, I like to call them, who uh, seem to represent the public. Well, suppose that we did develop systems that avoided these difficulties uh, for which one could not conceive of a scenario which leads to the kind of accident that you had either at Three Mile Island or at uh, Chernobyl. Would that be sufficient to ensure the resuscitation, the revival of nuclear energy? Would we then really uh, be able to look forward to a second nuclear era based on these improved reactors, this technological fix? I don't know. Uh, in some respects, there are some indications that some of the articulate anti-nuclear people are thinking along this line. Uh, I remind you that Michael Dukakis, who of course has been bitterly opposed to the Seabrook reactor in New Hampshire because it's too close in his view to the state line in Massachusetts, uh, he came out rather strongly against nuclear energy during the presidential com campaign, but he did concede that if the technologists came up with what I call inherently safe or passively safe or transparently safe reactors, reactors that are not subject to the kind of difficulties that uh, were experienced at Three Mile Island or at uh, Chernobyl, that he would be uh, prepared to reconsider his position on nuclear energy. Uh, perhaps even more important, all of you I think have heard of Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich, you remember, is the great guru of population explosion. He's written the population bomb. He was one of the original environmental gurus uh, 
he, along with Barry Commoner, I guess, are as responsible as any for uh, the great sensitivity that, of course, we all uh, now experience and respect the preservation of the environment. I was at a meeting with Paul Ehrlich about uh, four months ago, and the subject was carbon dioxide and nuclear energy. And I expressed pretty much the same views that I'm expressing here, that we think that uh, we can go back to the drawing board and come up with uh, nuclear systems that avoid many of the difficulties that present generation nuclear uh, reactors has been uh, plagued with. And would you believe that Paul Ehrlich, who has generally been one of the most uh, violent, I guess I'd say, anti-nuclear people in the whole environmental community, at the plenary lecture at uh, Virginia Institute of Technology in Blacksburg, there were 2,000 students present there. Paul Ehrlich put on his marvelous show. He's a wonderful speaker, if any of you have heard him speak. And he said he, in view of his concern about greenhouse was prepared to reconsider his position on nuclear energy. He would now concede that nuclear energy does have uh, a role to play. Uh, people, when I tell them this story, they just don't believe, but I assure you that's exactly what, uh, what he said. And so I think that if nuclear is to make a comeback, and as you can see, I, I betray a, a certain partiality towards nuclear. Uh, I think that perhaps the most important thing is to convince these skeptical elites like Paul Ehrlich, like Michael Dukakis, uh, like the scientist uh, from the Audubon Society, uh, Jan Baia, that in fact, it is possible to come up with technological fixes that uh, will allow us to go ahead and not to reject one of the most important uh, alternatives uh, uh, in energy production, an alternative which is practical and which doesn't produce or, or essentially doesn't produce any carbon dioxide. So here I am, a technical fixer, uh, advising once again that the technical fix is the way to go. But I guess I, I have to say that uh, I have my own doubts as to whether technical fixes by themselves are going to do the trick. And I suppose the thing that bothers me as much as anything is that I do agree with Paul Ehrlich in this essential respect. If you look at why it is that we seem somehow to uh, be constrained by deterioration of the environment, whether or not that deterioration of the environment has anything to do with our life expectancy, uh, one cannot help but believe that the fundamental issue is population. And that to deal in uh, a deep-seated and thoroughgoing way with these issues of the environment, it is uh, fruitless to talk about these things unless one is willing to speak very directly to the whole question of population. We have about five billion people in the world today. The estimates, uh, incidentally, that five billion is rather higher than uh, the UN predicted about 30 years ago, uh, where will it end? 10 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion? And I think all of us, even technological fixers like Alvin Weinberg, will concede that the fundamental and ultimate issue is the population question. But to achieve real uh, success in population, I think that probably the most important thing is to uh, raise the living standard throughout the world. As the living standard goes up, the population tends to level off. And so I guess I would view these technological fixes which I offer as a resolution of the environmental 
problems. I view these as a means of buying time, buying enough time so that China, India, and when you speak of China, India, you've practically spoken about the, the primary problems, give them the opportunity, give them the time to raise their living standards so that they will go through what the demographers call, uh, call the demographic transition. I'm 75 years old now. Uh, almost everybody in this audience is a good deal younger than I. And so uh, for me, well, almost. Uh, 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 <laughs> I look at all these faces and, you know, when we came to Oak Ridge, they're all a bunch of youngsters. And I still think of everybody as youngsters. Uh, and the way we are, I suppose. Ernie here, he was a kid when he first came to Oak Ridge. He came to our school and, and yeah, he went to school here. Uh, I, I offer these suggestions. Even I won't live to, say, the year 2025. I hope some of you will be living by the year 2025. And I hope by then you will see that these technological fixes will have taken hold that nuclear energy will occupy the place that I think it, it properly deserves, and that we will, in fact, be making serious progress in dealing with the central issue, which is ultimately population. Thank you. We're so thrilled. I think that maybe we feel like we are going to be able to survive, you know, the next few years. Uh, Bonnie Carroll has a microphone, and will you ask Bonnie, will you see who would like some questions? Thank you. And they'll say, well, 10 years from now we'll have fusion. Doesn't make any difference what the date is. I say, okay, let's bet. One dollar. That's the limit of my bet. And I've just made lots of money over these 40 years, always betting. No matter what day you put, you won't have it. So far I've won all the time. That doesn't mean I'll always win, but I tend to be agnostic. But uh, perhaps more relevant question, what about solar energy? And solar is great, except it's expensive. Now there are those who say that solar will become less expensive. Wonderful. I visited recently a plant where they make these solar cells. I'm rather impressed. Uh, I'm also concerned about the problems of solar. The main problem being that the sun doesn't shine all the time. What do you do when the sun isn't shining? Not so much the day-night cycle, which you can deal with, but suppose you have a, a run of maybe uh, 10 days when it's cloudy. It's not so good. But solar, of course, is the ultimate uh, competitor efficient. I don't know ultimately which one is going to win. Question? Do you feel that... Um, who else? Why don't you identify yourself? I'm from Atlanta. You're who? I don't live in Mary. <laughs> Lucy Sunshine. 
Huh? You probably are for solar energy then. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, so am I. Do you feel that any public utility could overcome the public skepticism and create any more nuclear plants? Not now. Not now. Not now. Even with this new research? Well, as I say, I don't know what I don't know whether this new kind of reactor is going to be uh, sufficient to restore the public's confidence in nuclear energy. I hope that will happen, but I can't say whether it will or not. At present, of course, no new, uh, public utility is going to build a, a nuclear plant. Doris Cassius from Memphis, Tennessee. What about the problem of nuclear waste in the environment? Glad you asked. Uh, let me explain that there is an essential uh, difference between the problem of reactor safety and the problem of nuclear waste. In the case of reactor safety, there is enormous energy that is being generated in the reactor. For example, at, at Chernobyl, there was an enormous amount of energy which spread the waste, well, the, the radioactivity, all over. In the case of the nuclear waste, that's, there's just as much radioactivity, but you don't have, as the engineers put it, a driving force because the energy has largely been dissipated and therefore the problem is very different from the reactor problem. In the reactor, as Chernobyl suggested, it is not impossible for fairly large numbers of people to receive large doses of radiation. In the case of nuclear waste, since there is no driving force that spreads them all over the place, it is not possible to expose large numbers of people to large amounts of radiation. It is possible to expose a few people, a few people who are working on the waste, to fairly large uh, amounts of radiation. That would be basically an industrial, small-scale industrial accident. Or it is possible to have large numbers of people receive very minute levels of radiation. And so with respect to the nuclear waste, the issue hangs on how dangerous are very minute amounts of radiation. Amounts of radiation that correspond in this sneaky little quiz to snuggling close to someone, maybe your spouse, at night. <laughs> now, I'm not kidding. Uh, this is a very important and essential point. The question of how dangerous are extremely low levels of radiation. Levels of radiation considerably below the uh, background levels of radiation. And since there are vast populations that are exposed to like twice the amount of radiation that we are exposed to right here in Oak Ridge because they live, say, in Denver where the altitude is higher, uh, we have made our peace with levels of radiation of that order and there is no evidence at all, none whatsoever, that there's any difference in life expectancy between people who are exposed to levels here in Oak Ridge or people who are exposed to levels, say, uh, twice the level at Oak Ridge. And so I would say that there is this essential difference between the waste problem and the reactor problem. The reactor problem, it is possible, technically, to have large numbers of people receive large amounts of radiation. In the case of waste, it is not possible. Now, I could go on for hours, but that, I think, is the essence of the issue. I'm Bill Weinstein from Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in um, the funding of the Oak Ridge Laboratory. Uh, the government has changed its attitude considerably um, to some programs uh, similar to you, not similar, but uh, in the same area. Um, has it changed its attitude towards the Oak Ridge Laboratory? Well, uh, I won't answer that question. You see, uh, I uh, left the Oak Ridge National Laboratory 17 years ago, and I adopted a policy of not trying to 
kibitz uh, what goes on at Oak Ridge at the laboratory uh, in the intervening years. But we do happen to have here the former acting director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and presently associate director, Al Zucker. And Al, why don't I ask you to make That's a good question, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> question is, what about the funding of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory? Well, uh, I think that was the question. There's been a, a secular change over the last uh, 20 years. It was a laboratory that uh, was funded about 80% for uh, fish and energy. And, uh, and it's that means nuclear reactors. It's for reactor research and related uh, uh, reprocessing and related uh, activities. Uh, at its lowest point, uh, nuclear energy was funded around 8%, which was a very large drop. Uh, at the moment, uh, nuclear energy uh, reactor, uh, reactor research is, is going up, is around 15%. Uh, the laboratory itself is the most diverse laboratory uh, in the world, I suppose. Uh, its uh, largest uh, single program is in uh, conservation research, and uh, the uh, program in fusion is, uh, is also large. We do uh, close to $100 million worth of uh, basic uh, science, so it's a very diverse uh, kind of enterprise. Uh, and, uh, but one of its uh, the significant uh, areas, of course, is uh, nuclear energy research, which now uh, deals mostly with nuclear safety and uh, the kinds of reactors that Alvin was talking about, uh, reactors that have uh, features that, uh, by their very nature, make them uh, uh, safe and impossible to do certain things. They can't explode like Chernobyl simply because they uh, that would violate the laws of physics. And also, a uh, laboratory is one of the largest environmental laboratories in the world now, isn't it, Alex? It, it, it was uh, actually the first large environmental laboratory, and it is now the, one of the largest uh, such in the, in the world. <coughs> And see that that national okay. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Weinberg, uh, I think one of the things that really uh, hit me about what you said today is that the public is very, very wary of any kind of technology today. That they have felt that they have been uh, lied to and things have been secreted by the government and not uncovered by the government when they possibly knew that there was something wrong. I think there's a tremendous ambivalence concerning uh, organizations like the EPA and their dissembling of information. So that I think that in order, and I, I don't know if you agree with me, that in order to break down the barriers against things like uh, clean nuclear energy and uh, safe nuclear energy, you have to break down the barrier of the public's fear of that they are not being told the whole truth about safety and what goes on. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me on that. Well, in some respects I do. And uh, although uh, Secretary of Energy Watkins is uh, proving to be a terrible pain to all of us old nukes because he's spending all his money, well not all, but just an awful lot of money, in cleaning up the environment, uh, getting it uh, clean uh, to an extent that far surpasses any justified degree of uh, cleanliness as uh, estimated by the best environmentalists in the world. But nevertheless, I think there is method to his madness, and it has to do with exactly the point you're making. That I think he perceives that, uh, well, energy in general, but in particular nuclear energy, its future hangs in the balance. 
and that it is necessary for the public to somehow regain confidence in the Department of Energy. And he therefore does uh, these things, which many of us think of as being rather crazy, and technologically they are crazy, but they seem to be necessary, at least in his judgment, they are necessary in order to restore the confidence of the public in the Department of Energy. I think that's essentially the answer that I give to your question. Marilyn Lipperman, Knoxville. If you could dream for the future the direction that we're going to go with this nuclear energy, what would be some of your dreams? Oh, well, I've, it's not a dream. I've, I've given speeches. I said I give speeches. And, uh, I, I, in fact, next week I'm giving a speech at uh, Bureau of Standards. The title of the speech is uh, Nuclear Energy and the Greenhouse Effect. And what do I say ought to happen? Well, what I say is that we should somehow limit the growth of total energy in the world from the present level to maybe a level 30 to 40 percent, well, 40 percent higher than the present level. We should cut back our burning of fossil fuel, that's mainly coal, uh, to about two-thirds of what we are now using. And the remainder should be largely nuclear energy based on these better kinds of reactors that I speak of. That would entail, between now and the year 2040, 2050, an increase in the number of nuclear reactors throughout the world from the present roughly 500. There are about 500 large nuclear reactors throughout the world. An extraordinary number for a guy like me who was there when there were no nuclear reactors. In fact, we didn't have a uh, chain reaction. Here I'm still alive and there are 500 nuclear reactors. It's really quite extraordinary. That includes those that are still under construction. So I would recommend, and in the speech I make the proposal, that we go from 500 nuclear reactors to 5,000 nuclear reactors, 10 times as many nuclear reactors. These would have to be of this newer type, which are immune from the kind of problem that we encountered with uh, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. And uh, I think we can afford this, and I think it's not, not a crazy scenario. Uh, whether it happens or not, I don't know. I guess my feeling about the matter is, although I place this scenario in the context of global warming, and say that this is really what has to be done in order to uh, combat global warming, I think that it makes sense anyhow to move very heavily towards nuclear energy, whether or not global warming is, a, is an issue, because in my opinion, it makes sense to develop these nuclear reactors that are inherently uh, safe. Uh, I should point out that the scenario that I project does involve an enormous amount of conservation. Some of you may have listened to the orators at Earth Day. Remember, Earth Day was just a week ago. And I was astonished and I must say appalled by the fact that one orator after another got up and said, Greenhouse is practically here, it's going to get worse. We got to do something about it. What can we do? Well, they said you can plant trees. Yes, you can plant trees, but you can't plant anywhere near enough trees. In fact, the idea of planting trees was originated at the, our Institute for Energy Analysis by a famous physicist, Freeman Dyson. Some of you may, may have heard of him. And we've made the estimates. You can't plant enough trees, but it's good to plant trees. Wonderful. It gives people the feeling that they're doing something about it. The second thing you should do is move towards solar energy. Again, I think that's great. In fact, uh, one of the few claims to fame I have in my young life was when I was in the White House in, at the height of the energy uh, crisis, the one thing that our little Office of Energy Research and Development did 
Well, we said, look, we got to do solar seriously, and therefore we have to establish the Solar Energy Research Institute, and that actually has been established, and we have a Solar Energy Research Institute. But I remain very agnostic about solar energy. Great, do whatever you can. I don't think it'll do the trick. But finally, and this was the real darling of the orators, was we must conserve. And the conservation was very extreme. Now, when I talked to my good friend, Professor Liu, who is an expert from China, I mean, he's a professor from China, happens to be here in Oak Ridge now, I say, look, can China become developed? Can China deal with a population problem? Uh, if you adopt that conservation scenario, he says, we in China laugh, laugh at the prescriptions that are offered to us by outsiders from the West who don't really understand anything about China. And so it is my belief that, uh, and, and as I say, my great disappointment that I heard nobody at Earth Day who even whispered the possibility of nuclear energy had any relevance to the greenhouse effect. I think that was a terrible error on the part of the uh, people who ran Earth Day. I hope I more or less answered your question. Well, should we have one man give a, a <laughs> question and then I think we ought to one last break up. Yeah. Dr. Weinberg, I was privileged to study at the Oak Ridge School of Reactive Technology to your, your directorship at the lab. I reiterate what you said about going from 500 to 5,000 nuclear reactors, saying that we have to go from perhaps 100 to 1,000 nuclear reactors here in the USA. And I say, to understand the second era of nuclear power, without going into the details of the specific trees, we must understand the forest, and particularly the fossilized fuel forest of USA and world oil running out. Just one number, we use 16 million barrels a day of oil in the US about now. 10 million barrels a day has to be replaced by 400 nuclear plants and 800 million tons of coal. So you multiply these numbers, and you see you're talking of a thousand nuclear plants in the middle of the next century for national survival and not at 30 to 40 percent more energy but maybe 30 to 40 percent less usable energy than we have now thank you dr weinberg not as a technologist but as a leader of the first era of nuclear energy thank you i really don't disagree with what you said thank you